Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to yet another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Rugby in partnership with our good friends at City Index, who are the leading providers of spread betting, CFD, and FX trading. And first up, it's Christmas time. And with that in mind, it's a time of giving. We'd like to give a proper blast of thanks to our sponsors, City Index. The magic doesn't happen without them. And here's a little message from them to you. Trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. Good stuff. Thank you, as always, to our good friends at City Index. Um, There is a lot to get into this week. It's a huge week of rugby in the club game, obviously. Northern Hemisphere rugby continues to surge upwards. We've got the Harnikin (coughs) Champions Cup shaping up to be something special again. Hask is uh, still in, I think he's still in Dubai, Tins. DJ, have you watched any of his socials? I have been watching a bit of his socials. I imagine he's not having a bad time. He was slightly pumped. He was a head of disclosure, wasn't he? Yes. The good thing is when the cat's away, we're allowed to talk rugby. He's not terribly good on the detail (laughs) of the game. He's quite good on the personalities. But joining us this week, I am really excited to have Ireland, Leinster and Lions legend. Uh, won the European Cup with them a couple of times. Record try scorer. First player to be capped 200 times for the province. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. You proud of that? Oh, yeah, yeah, very proud. Yeah. <laughs> Still there. Hang on. <laughs> um, the perfect guy to tell us uh, about Leinster going into uh, Europe this season, about all things Ireland. We'll balance that out against England and France, who are probably the three big guns in the tournament this year. It's the one and only Shane Horgan. Nice how, to be here. Thanks how, for having me. How are I you? don't feel as if I'm quite a like for like replacement for Hask, but and I'll that's do my why best. we've got you. <laughs> in. That's why, we, that's why we, we are trying to make it semi permanent. Yeah. <laughs> and again, I you know I'm here under <coughs> false uh, auspices as well. I I thought I was reviewing Rook Me, his his new book, and get my hands on some of that would, sweet merch. Would you well. like to do that? I what would, is your review of Rook yeah. Me? <laughs> <laughs> Rhymes with yeah. We take. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you? Before we get into all things rugby, how's life? All good. Yeah, very good. Um, back. Uh, kind of loving rugby again, which is is something that wasn't the case during the summer. Yeah, um, South Africa. I think they did this to a lot of people. They single-handedly <laughs> tried to destroy rugby, uh, <laughs> but it didn't work. And as a result of that kind of really weird series, I think you know rugby moved on a little bit. The way it refed moved on a little bit, and it just you know I, I know Ireland played particularly well in this um, series, but um, it made me fall back in love with rugby again, which is uh, a nice place to be. Were you over in Dublin for those games? I wasn't. No, no. I wasn't. Um, I'm I'm based in the UK now, so I was here and it uh, coincided with a nice bout of Corona for me and my family as well. So um, Is that an excuse just to spend a couple of weeks in bed? <laughs> yes, exactly. Sadly <laughs> not. Um, what do you do? So, but before we come on to you and, and all things rugby, what, what's keeping you busy these days? So it's Soccer Aid. Yeah, so I, I work with that. Soccer Aid. We put that together um, year on year and um, been doing that for about three years now. Um, looking forward to it again uh, this year. And then I also sort of, um, still do some work back home in Ireland with, with Virgin Media, who have the Six Nations and the European Cup. So yeah. I've kept going and, and got um, two little girls as well who've um, really been taking up a lot of my time. And also, I think I have a newfound respect for anyone who plays rugby and has kids at the same time. I right. don't know how anybody does that. Yeah. I'm constantly tired all the time. So just the <laughs> idea of trying to, you know, go for a run, never mind be a professional rugby player while that's happening is borderline ridiculous. So kudos do you, and to do the you, young dads. To the young dads. <laughs> which I'm not. Uh, but do you, I mean, do you keep fit? So on Socrate, if, if they're ever a man down with 10 minutes to go, would you be able to put your boots on and, and where would you play? Uh, I, I think the, you know, the, the level of, of uh, celebrity is, is would have to be really <laughs> fall off a cliff if they're going to come to me. I think. <laughs> never never say never. I get, get this man here on, on bat dial. So he's, he's always there just in case. I, I got, I got a phone call actually from Matt Wilkins. It's Matt Wilkins, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Um, literally five days before it, so someone must have dropped out. Right. <laughs> no, like, no, oh, no, actually, no, actually, no, no, no. We got, it all not. comes together we in the got, last 10 minutes. No, no, we completely it. forgot about you. Would you really <laughs> like to have a game? I was like, I actually would have loved to have a game, but I can't. But what no, I what can't. position would you play? Uh, I left, played left one, right out. I played yeah. once for um, a talk sport team uh, against uh, a Welsh team just outside of Cardiff. Sorry. 
if anyone's listening who who Barry. and I played center center defense. Did you? And that's literally. definitely a that's a definitely a position <laughs> <laughs> in, in football. <laughs> center defense. <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah. Center, center back. Center back. back. Right. Well, um and yeah, just took took people's legs and right. got my head in the way, dived in the way. Boris Johnson. Basically style. no skill but commitment. Yeah, but we listen, we played rugby because we couldn't play football or anything else. So <laughs> that's right. that's well well documented. You did a bit you did GAA growing up as well. Yeah, right? I did. That was that was maybe my number one sports. I did athletics and, and GAA and GAA and rugby right through my teens was a, you know, so I did both and, and loved GAA. But then so you know, the, the opportunity to play professionally came along. And then it just it just dropped out, and bizarrely, from something that I would have played, you know, every day or d- multiple times a week, yeah. just at eighteen, dropped it, and I never picked up a ball again. It's, it's strange. I always wanted to, and my brother um, played for a local team, and and GAA is very community based as well. So I always had it in my head that when I finished playing rugby, I'd go back and and we we'd play together. But because of injury, I I never did, and and that. But we're both too old now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's not, it's not a never league. too old. Never too, yeah. never too old. Um, <laughs> But it, so was it rugby because it was a career? And, and also I loved it, you know, yeah. and good at it, you know, so that's kind of, that was the triumph for it, you know. It does um, always help that. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, you think, oh, actually, this this is, you know, you can play at a high level, or you think you can play a high level, but then definitely being able to do it as a job was definitely yeah. a motivating factor, you know, it's it focused the mind. And, you know, if, if GA was a, a professional game, you know, maybe you'd think, you may think that as, a, as an opportunity or a career path, but I like the idea of, of, doing sport for a job. Yeah, because that's what uh, Jill was saying when we were at Dungannon, wasn't it? In the fact that, because GAA is sort of built on parishes, isn't it, more than anything else, and that community feel, and she was saying that's what (coughs) the women's game needs to sort of get into with the city, more in the cities, is making that sort of parish community feel about women's rugby and and sort of getting it to kick on that way. And how long have you been, have your boots been in the potting shed? Would it be 10 years? Yeah, it's not far off 10 years. Yeah. Really? Get, How does that make you feel? Get less for murder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, does it feel like a lifetime ago? It does. It, feel like it, it feels, it feels, you know, I feel, although I, you know, still, um, you know, analyze rugby and, and I'm still involved in rugby and it's a, still a major part of my life, you know, being a rugby player feels like a, not just a, like a lifetime ago, it just feels like it didn't even happen, if that makes sense. It just seems feels so alien. Mm. They think the idea of that's what I did every day, um, also, you know, watching the players play and I think there's just so much about rugby that's bizarre. You know, you yeah. see players getting up, their heads split, you know, and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> he lacerated a kidney. You know, I mean, this this yeah. stuff that that uh, you know that's normalised in rugby and is completely normal. But then when you're outside of rugby or in your own normal life, and you, you you just see how you know regular people are, yeah. you just think how bizarre and unnatural a life that was. But it was, you know, absolutely loved it and brilliant. But yeah, it's I, I sometimes feel. It was who was that guy who played that sport during that time for that yeah. long? I'm not that tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all right. You get back out there, you can still fold up a young kid every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw you do that at Dungana. Absolutely <laughs> criminal. Um, I am really, really pleased to have you on. I mean, you are one of my faves because ah. ma- mainly because you you kind of got me through four years of broadcasting the Pro Four. I know. On Sky, I, which I, was, I was. It was. A, it was a rough, dark time. I, I felt like a counselor for yes, you for I'm a long time. You'd that. come from the dizzy heights of, uh, of of Premiership rugby, and you were like their most avid fan. And then just seeing this hangdog expression on your face when we had to go away and do it. Italy versus it, it, when it, was, it was Connacht against the Dragons in was Galway it? with the rain coming up at you which I've never experienced before we were under a gazebo one time I remember that yeah, I remember that very um, well and the gazebo yeah it was like this was like, doesn't I'm, work against rain that comes from the sides <laughs> <laughs> it was Arctic but you were you were a very very good friend and I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to you for wearing a smile when we, when we all needed it um, what is really interesting though about your career is that you were absolutely part of I'm going to say the explosion at Leinster and then Ireland as well. And Ireland had been kind of muddling around a bit in the 90s, awful 99 World Cup, etc. Um, I'm not going to give you credit for all of it, but you were well, part yeah, of listen, But you, but, I feel free the, to give it. I was one of five who saved rugby, not all me. There was five Absolutely. of us on that first cap day. There so. were, there were. But, but I mean, when you look at your career now and the journey that you went on, how do you kind of square all that away? Um, it was, you know, joking aside, there's... My career coincided with this revolution in rugby in Ireland anyway. So I was, you know, as fortunate to, as anyone to be part of that ride. So like to, to demonstrate that is, uh, well, I played my first game away to Munster 
for, for Leinster Interpro game and we played in Dura Doyle, which is where Gary Owen played. I would say maximum 300 people there wow. and I knew almost all of them, <laughs> all of them. And, <laughs> Mom, a, Dad. and a good number of them were my family yeah. <laughs> so that's that happened and it was almost 10 years later I think it was almost you know exactly 10 years later Leinster played Munster in the European Cup semi-final in Crow Park with over 80,000 people watching and that, it, the game had just completely changed completely yeah. changed in you know, in the public consciousness in Ireland, how it had moved from a professional game, an amateur game to a professional game, how it moved from um, a club-based, you know, focus on clubs really, was very strong in Ireland, the All-Ireland League, into, um, you know, a province or regional game and how Europe in particular sparked sparked something in the in the consciousness of, of the rugby public. And, and it just became... Uh, publicized in a much bigger way. You know, r- rugby is still not that big a sport, you know, in Ireland. You know, soccer is still bigger. Gaelic sports, both GAA and hurling, are still bigger than rugby. But, uh, you know, and the, and the population that plays isn't huge. But against that, the sort of coverage uh, it receives and, you know, how it's viewed is, is massive. So I was part of that massive change and pro- the start of professionalism. And, you know, again, when I started with Leinster, I think they had four full-time professionals. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, then the year after we had a squad of, you know, <laughs> they're meant to be professionals, but it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't quite professional. And the moving from that, you know, sort of piss take scenario where you're professional in that you're getting paid, but you're not living a professional yeah, lifestyle. They were the greatest days. They were like <laughs> so good. Like a Monday night club was... Well, so we, we, we were talking about, about this. Exactly. It was like we had a Sunday night club, oh. Monday night club. Tuesday night club. Yeah. yeah. Wednesday, Wednesday we were thinking, well, maybe we need to start. So we'd just meet for a couple, just yeah. to get, get off it, and then Thursday off till the game on Saturday. I that, know, I don't I know you, you know, there's a bit of you know um you know gilding the lily here, but there was a lot of drinking done in those early years. It, there was you know, you're a young guy in the city. Why would you not? Well, you've got you know, you've nothing else to do, you know, you've enough time on your hands. Yeah, and you and it was also there was this big change in rugby that happened where I don't know if you had this tense where it was almost like if you were acting professionally, that was seen as a bad thing. It was like, hey, look at this Egypt here. Look at this. Who's this Egypt eating his brown rice? And and it was more and and it was it was more the the people that you aspired to be yeah. were the people with that had the natural flair and the natural talent and the ease of doing it. And the, you know they didn't have they didn't have to. Um, it was pure talent. You know yeah. it wasn't industry, and that definitely changed. And it changed in Ireland. Even the connection sort of Roy Keane and his influence. And then it was that's. It switched around from people going admiring the people who were the hardest working. Before that, it was like the best people were the guys who didn't care; they could yeah. just turn up and do it. And there was definitely a bit of a buy into that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was exactly the same. I didn't really drink before I turned professional, <laughs> and then I never really looked back <laughs> after that. So, uh, yeah, and my mum used to always send down my food, and it was all carbs. And then you were thinking it's all had to be carbs. You were literally eating carbs oh. for every meal, and then. You were getting fatter and you're like, why, why am I getting fatter? And then actually nutrition came in. I had that same experience. It's like, I was 23. It was like, I, you know, I think maybe 20, 21, 22, 23, that time. It's like, I, because I was quite thin growing up and um, we weren't doing much weight. So I was like, I don't put on any weight. And then I remember going on holiday and I went with um, Dennis Hickey. And we went to Cuba and it was one of these kind of all you can eat self-contained <laughs> things. And I still have the photographs at home, which I will not show to anyone. <laughs> I, I looked like I ate myself. It was proper jelly. It's like, all oh, right, okay, I'm not one of those people who can eat just what they want. <laughs> I've discovered that. I think because one of the things that sort of working with you over the years that I've I've learned about you is you you're one of those people that's always got something good to go on to. Do you know what I mean by that? Every street has a party behind one door, and you're very good at finding. You've always you always know someone behind that door, I think. Mm. And I just kind of wonder now, when you look back at those Leinster days, I mean, basically, the, the question is formed off the back of having Brian on, when was that, in the summer on the Lions. Yeah. He's he sort of intimated that you were a very good babysitter of him. You're the master of the back of the photograph. You're never necessarily <laughs> under the spotlight, 
but you're always there well, in the background. I, 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 or is that very that's, un- that's I, No, I'm very glad if that's the position I hold. I'm right. The, the problem is when I'm in the forefront. That's right. the issue. Well, but he, I do said, love that. He, he said you had like the cloak that Harry Potter does where you just put it on and suddenly you just disappear Invisible. into nothing. Yeah, well, yeah. I think certainly a little bit later in my uh, my career, <laughs> that was that was one of the professional learnings that I had to use <laughs> the, the, the current term. Um, but that uh, that's funny that, you know, the next place, you know, I, I kind of, it's the one thing that I've, myself my wife sort of learned that that you go to the place yeah. and you go to the place after yeah. the problems come when you go to the third place don't ever go to the third place nothing good's happening there Ed Sheeran summed that. it up in that nothing good happens after two <laughs> song, yeah. it? it's true <laughs> but when you because you mentioned Dennis as well and Contopomi and Gerv the Swerve I mean you had a stellar stellar Leinster backline you had a hell of a Leinster team but how much fun it was obviously a lot of fun off the field how much fun was it on the pitch at times? It was good. Oh, I, I was it was built in like, I think we were hardwired to play a certain way as well. So, you know, part of that um uh, you know sort of mentality that meant that we were going out a lot when we were, you know, very young also meant that we wanted to play nice rugby and entertain and we had great backs and the other thing was we were all babies. Yeah. You know, if you look at the back line when we first came in and, and and you know, took over the Leinster backline really. So it was I was I was playing. There was Brian. There was Gordon, who was even yeah. younger. There was you know, Gervin was only the same age. Dennis, you know, seemed like an old lad. He was only like twenty two. Yeah. And um, you know, Felipe a little bit later on. But we we were you know we were absolute babies. And um, and so you know we had no inhibitions about playing. And also when as that change was occurring from. Um, from um, amateur to professional, it was much easier to jump in and take over at that point and be part of the team. Yeah. Whereas now, because everybody is, you know, the the players who are in situ are in unbelievable shape. They're being professional for you know x amount of years. It's very hard to to jump that gap. Whereas it was much easier when the guys that were in situ before us were in terrible shape. <laughs> <laughs> I think with that as well. Also, what was special about that is when you make. Literally, your whole back line changes, and it's all uh, young. It's so easy to take over and play how you want to play. You don't have, whereas if you have some seasoned pros in there who'll tell you you can't do that, or you do a bad offload and it goes to floor, right, cut that out. And all you know, that is the that was the, the good, uh, surely the good side from you is you could actually go in and just stamp your authority and didn't have anyone going, right, you need to rein that in a bit. Yeah. Play. And, and, and we then, and then uh, sort of Matt Williams came in fairly early and he. You know, he loved that style of play and he liked that back line and, and you know, wanted to, to lean into that. So we were very much, a, you know, there was a lot of focus on back play. And, and we also, and I left out Emmett Farrell, who, who was uh, over in the UK for a while, but he came back to play with Lancer again, only a really young guy. He was properly attacking, super flat in the way he played. So, yeah, it felt, it felt exciting being part of that back line. It was interesting when I pinged you and said, do you fancy come and love to chat? And you were like, yeah, but I don't want to talk about anything in my career. <laughs> I, I want to ask That's you about. Well. <laughs> I know, but but it's it, it was you had some he- amazing moments. I just want to ask you about three games in particular, though, and then actually I'll, I'll open up. You might want to yeah, reference a couple of others. No, because the first one is Leinster to lose, <laughs> out in Toulouse, which was because I think you'd lost a couple of big games in Europe, which you should have won, and then you went to that. It, was it two thousand and six? I'm going to throw it out there. Yeah, it's the that one where you right. ran, you ran riot. Yeah, and I I remember it. Actually, I remember it because it was... I love what you just did there. Yeah, sounds right. means you have no idea. <laughs> but he's, you're trusting that he's the biggest he's rugby He's the He's, he's the biggest rugby nose ever who remembers every day. He confidence. says it to us all the time. Yeah. We go, yeah, yeah, sounds 90% right. 90% of the time yeah. I'm wrong. But if you just say it with yeah, authority, he'll no, go, no, yeah, he's fact-checking here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Not a lot of facts. Um, I, so it, and if, if people are watching this or listening to this, it's worth a Google because it's one of the great European games. But I just wonder, uh, I suppose the question really was what that did for you as a team, that performance. Are we, am I picking out a game that just was one of many? Or no, did that no, feel that, like a it, seminal it, game? It was you? a special game, but at the same time, um, you know, we lost the very next game to um, Munster in the yeah. semi final in a, in, a, in a humiliating fashion. Yes. Like, a, like the worst defeat that I've, we've ever had. And is that the Rodge? Yeah, yeah, Rodge yeah. like Rodge handing off people to score a try. That's a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> so That's as low as it yeah, gets. can you imagine? Listen, lower the snake's belly. Um, so, so that, but it was definitely one of the sort of milestones on what we were doing. So, definitely with Leinster, we always knew we could. 
perform at a very high level and, and did, but that was definitely maybe the highest we'd ever performed at. The problem was with consistency and being able to deliver, you know, week in, week out in order to, you know, win a championship. But, you know, having played at that level, that's definitely sort of a, a psychological hurdle. And and there was a, there was definitely a recklessness in the way we were playing yeah. there. And, you know, when you had Felipe playing at 10, you got had to get used to a reckless, <laughs> reckless type of game. I mean, did, did he just say, I'm playing keep up? I mean, how, how did you work off someone who just, because I remember, because Dennis scored, you went from your oh, own yeah, line. Dennis scored in, in like one of the best tries ever. That yeah. was, that was, but just before that try, and there's not actually, you know, in your career, like a lot of stuff merges into one, but I remember that try so well yeah. because we were under in, incredible stress defensively. Yeah. And I ran in to try and, and uh, intercept a ball and just knocked it down. And it's like, oh, if I hadn't done that, I'm, you know, it's a completely different story and I'm embarrassed. And then somehow it recycled and there was bodies everywhere. Everybody was like on, uh, you know, hands on their knees, like sucking in air. Yeah. And Conte Pomey just comes out and he just goes. He didn't, it just total instinct. Like, boom, this is what we're doing. And when you had Dennis on the wing, you had someone properly fast, you yeah. know, properly fast. It was always, you know, um, just one of the things that we had in our back pocket. You know, they, my wing wasn't particularly fast, so we needed someone. <laughs> and, Dennis, and, and Dennis is a sprinter, you know, oh, yeah. so. I, I like that because I everyone still gives me abuse about the fact that he chased me down in my first game. And, uh, yeah. And over, it took him 45, still scored. Took him 45 me, meters to get me. And I was like, he was fast. Yeah. And don't forget, he was fast. Uh, Proper yeah, quick. I, and I wasn't quite that quick. Because the other thing I remember about that Leicester Toulouse game actually was your try, and it was there was a guy, it was Will Chignall and Stuart Barnes commentating, and they were very erudite in the way that they described they paint pictures with words. And your try, this just, oh, oh God! <laughs> yeah, and it just it almost just summed that the whole game was out of control, and they it, they just it just fitted perfectly with your score. But I just. I just, I just wonder on days like that whether you look back with the, the fondness of playing in those games that many Leinster fans will will remember them with as well. Yeah, that was that was a really um, beautiful memory as well because it was one of the first days that Leinster brought a proper crowd away from home. And um, my, my family went down. My brother was much younger. He brought some friends down, and there was a corner of of Leinster fans, and we weren't always as well supported and the whole thing was Munster you know Munster's support and you know they built that up over years in Europe and it had a key part in popularising you know rugby in Ireland without a doubt and they brought a brilliant travelling support and, and we didn't have as much because you know the main reason was we weren't putting our fans in a position where they could come to these games <laughs> <laughs> so you know hands up here um, but that was a real opportunity um, and uh, you know it's a nice trip away in Toulouse no, in, that's a good weekend. good, good weekend that's a good yeah. weekend um, you know Trevor Brennan holding court in his boozer as well yeah. so there was good reasons to go down and then the game just matched it yeah. as well and the way they played was phenomenal And but I never felt comfortable in that game I never felt comfortable because it's Toulouse and um, you know, we just didn't have a history of, of beating these French sides. It took us a very long time to beat our first French side in, in Europe away. Um, and then, you know, to, to have that as, as a shootout, it does. It's a properly great memory and, and not just on the pitch. The whole experience around it was so much fun. You can turn your cans off now. England, Ireland, 2006. What, yeah. What do you remember? Draco offside? Oh, a mile. <laughs> A mile. So it's, one context, of the, it's one of the main reasons that I hate um, um, TMOs and reviews now. It's like, no, we need to remove that from the game. Gets rid of too many moments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. moments. It'll be erasing half my history. <laughs> but but so the context for, for those who don't go quite that far back, 24-21 uh, to England with two minutes on the clock, Ireland on for a triple crown, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. And you are under the pump. On, I think, it was, was it a scrum? It was, it was a scrum just, I think, on your 22. just inside, inside, inside the 22. 22. Yeah. And um, we kind of had a bit of a conflab as what to do. And um, Drico said, I'll, I'll stand 10, years, 10 yards upfield and see what happens. <laughs> I'm Brian O'Driscoll. I don't get called for offside. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and Rob ch um, Rog chipped it over, which I think, you know, speaking about you know, that Leinster, that young backline that was in the Leinster and, and sort of a bravery around doing stuff, you know, that's that was Ronan. It was Ronan, Peter, two halfbacks for Ireland who were, on, again, only babies when they came in. Yeah. And having you know, the ambition and the courage to do something like that in Twickenham at that stage of the game. Um, and, you know, he was miles offside. And then I was unbelievably slow and not being able to finish first time round. And I remember as I was running, 
um, thinking if if I don't score, this is this is not good for me. I'm getting <laughs> caught by a seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, like, Lewis Moody. Yeah, yeah. Mudos was chasing Matt. But what goes on skate? Voicey, how he missed that bounce, that ball. <laughs> And literally, Voicey was in a perfect position and it came across and it just bounced and he ran into the, the wrong position. The and it sat, as it always did, sat perfectly for Draco to yeah, take yeah. it. Whereas I think Voicey should have had, had that and it would have stopped there. And um, But yeah, a hell of a finish though. Did, did that change things for you in Ireland? Because I remember the commentary was went enormous on the back of it. You know, it's, it, yeah. it's a game-changing score. I do think there's a couple personally. of things that sort of changed my life. I think not to be too sort of grand about it. Yeah. And... Um, that was one of them, um, because that um, sort of changed. I, I think probably I was I was became a lot more well known in Ireland and associated with that moment. And and I remember doing something um, in a school, um, you know, a good few years ago now. And you know, said, you know, we were kids, you know, looking for career advice, you know, and, and as, uh, to become a rugby player. You know, what what you need to do to become a successful rugby player? I said, you know, score a couple of tries against England. <laughs> that, that really work <laughs> well for you. That's, yeah. it's not it's not that tricky. Um, but that then allowed me, I think, to sort of move on to the next stage of my life and still, you know, stay involved in rugby because there were key moments that yeah. people associated um, me with. And and the same with European Cup. I don't think we had this kind of saga with the European Cup in Leinster and thinking that we would never win it with this really, you know, generation of, of great players. And it did look if it was gone. If you think even the year before we won it, like the the balance between Munster and Leinster was there was, you know, no comparison. They were, you know, top of the world and won two two uh honey, honey cups and we looked a long way away from it. Um, so then having been able to go through that process and won two European Cups right right at the tail end of my career. Um, again, that sort of allowed me, you know, sort of the, to, the, almost the, to be validated, to be able to speak about rugby and um, to analyze it. And so, yeah, it had, I think it had a really, and you don't recognize it at the time, but it did have a you know, big effect on my life, I think. Might not have had pace, but at least you had long arms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and power. Yeah. And power. Um, I mean, thanks, you, thanks to the power. <laughs> I was happy with long arms. Yeah. yeah. It worked when you need them. Um, you obviously play, and I imagine most, most of the time people talk to you about, Winning World Cups, Hask played 77 times for England. Most people talk to him about running into a post or squirting water <laughs> at Joe Marlon. What are the things that people talk to you most about when they when they say, oh, I loved it when, dot, dot, dot? I doubt, um, I'm lucky because those you know, memories against England, sorry, mate, but, but they are the ones and, and in the consciousness of Ireland sport, they're massive, massive days. And I know yeah. it's... I know they're big days for England as well when they're playing the Six Nations, but it's not quite the same. You know, if uh, if the other nations gear up in a different way against England, and that rivalry is is uh, sort of deep rooted. So, um, you know, the, you know, like the audience that uh, Ireland England games gets in Ireland is 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 borderline ridiculous. So, um, you know, those those England games that are the ones that people are really nice to me about, and it's <laughs> it's a nice. It's nice to have that in your life. Yeah. You know, it's nice to have that in your life when people are, associate you with a good memory, whether, you know, them you know, watching it or, or, or actually being in the game. So the third game I wanted to ask you about was Ireland-England in 07 at Croker. Mm. Um, I, it just Because you, you're quite a historian, aren't you? You're quite into... Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Like you're, 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 you you are, might be overstating that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're interested in yeah. context and, and that kind of thing. And I just would... I've never really asked you about that day and the political charge around it and and what Ireland did on the field. I mean, was that a was that just a game of rugby or did you feel that day at Croke Park and the significance of, of the story that goes around that that it was a very different day for you as a rugby player? Yeah, it was. It was it felt like um it was part of there was definitely a sort of a social history element to it. And and rugby and sport in Ireland is complex as well in many ways because the GEA is very, you know, sort of rooted in um, sort of, you know, the, as you said, the, the, the parish, the community, um, sort of you know, nationalism as well. And, and it's, you know, it's very much about Irishness, whereas rugby hasn't always had that, you know, I suppose it, it, because it was you know, um, um, uh, uh, what would be a garrison game. So it was a British sport that came over. It's played in the schools, but then also has this kind of um, offshoot in Limerick where it's, you know, you know very much a, a dominant sport in Limerick. And then with even pr within provincial towns in Ireland, which is where I played, uh, having not played in school, um, there's kind of another cohort of people. So this idea of, you know, 
were were people who were representing Ireland in rugby as I, Irish enough, if that if yeah. that makes sense. And and uh, I'm simplifying here, but there was something in it, and um, this gave the opportunity to you know to sort of you know move into that space as it yeah. were, and. Uh, it was it was sort of it was sort of momentous because there was there was a again there was a group of people who didn't want that match to take place in Crow Park, and I found that bizarre for the for those reasons because I said listen we're representing Ireland this is exactly what we we should be doing, um but there was definitely and I remember there was uh, protests outside no not many you know yeah. there wasn't a huge but there was there there were and there was a debate going on so there felt like a big pressure to to win as well because like whatever about what goes on here if we don't if we lose this is this is not going to yeah. be manageable in, in the country anymore for us we're going to be we're going to be pariahs we knew that so we played our role <laughs> <laughs> we certainly did that bit well do you know what I do I do um, do remember um, Martin Curry was captain and there was all this talk beforehand about whether the um, God Save the Queen would be respected and um, and whether there would be booing. And I think there was, uh, it was anticipated there would be some sort of reaction. I don't know, what did... Yeah, uh, well, we were, we were sort of laid, from my memory, we were sort of laid the worst case, what it was going to be like and what to expect. And it was always, it always now, looking back, was a worst case scenario because I was about to say, this is where, again, rugby as a sport and what it is sort of stood up, is it was unbelievably respectful. We knew we had to be respectful in the way that we went about our business because there was that history there and, and we had to respect that and, and understand that the significance that it was. But then I think, and as you say, there were a few, but not not what was predicted, not what was told was going to happen. And then the game went off in my mind as being very emotionally charged for the right reasons yeah. in the stands and the noise that was coming out of the stands. And... Uh, I enjoyed the experience, apart from getting 47 points put on us or whatever it was. Um, I actually thought it, it was a fantastic, it created a fantastic atmosphere with respect from both sides, which we always have, um, but to another level. Um, and I thought it was a great game. Obviously, we, we, I would have preferred it to have been close and it had gone, yeah. <laughs> gone down to the wire or something, but... Um, but that atmosphere was <laughs> was amazing, and when um, there was no uh, jeering at "God Save the Queen," I remember Martin Curry came up and he, and he, he applauded. Uh, it was almost like he he was expecting something different. Yeah, we've been told it. Was yeah, way different. and I I think that had an impact on the on the game because it was almost disarming. Yeah. So I think if there had been shouting and screaming, there could have been you know you guys would have pulled in the huddle and gone these. Fucking, you know, yeah. da 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 da. Look what they don't respect us. They wouldn't even, you know, they wouldn't even respect our our uh, national anthem. And then, you know, you find that another emotional level. Now we were on that emotional level for a different reason, and I think emotion plays a huge part in in sport. And it's very hard to recreate. You know, yeah. you can be you, know, you can be skilled, you can be prepared, you can have your um, you know, your plays ready. But there is an emotional pitch that you can you're always trying to get to, and how you get to it or what feeds into it is is, is very you know difficult. I've always said this about Island Home Night in the fact that when there's some there's a reason to win, yeah, or there's a, an emotional driver to win, they'll always they they take their game to a whole different level. And you can say, as he said, if if there'd have been a booing and giving us that emotional charge, would it have helped us? You never know, but. That's what the the fans do so well, and they play their role within it because they just like to say, "Ah, oh, you you played so well." Come with kindness. No, you got you put forty seven points. In. <laughs> ah, but you tried your best. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you recognize that emotional charge though? Because actually, I think I think it was oh seven the year that so you lost to France at Kroger, didn't you? Yes, Vincent we Clark. did in the last should, minute. Should have been a grand. In the last slip. minute, should have been a grand. Slip. We had a very good team that year. Very good team. And but I think that was the year that O'Con you had a documentary team, and O'Connell came out with a line. Have you put the fear of God yeah, into someone yeah, today? Yeah, there was that, and then you know that emotion didn't. And that World Cup, we went into that World Cup, you know, with a really good group of players. Yeah, you know, thinking we were going to be successful. I think, and not you know, not misplaced. I thought you know we we, we had just we ticked a lot of the boxes that you need to tick in order to be successful in the World Cup, and then just blew up emotionally as well, and had a disastrous World Cup. Like, and and careers never recovered from from it. Um, have you, have so, you ever? 
Was there, a, was there ever a why? For oh, that? listen, we're, I, we could we have a <laughs> five-hour right? five podcast <laughs> really? on that. Just, yeah, it's very difficult. Very, I've never, I've truly not been able to figure, figure it out. I think there's, there was a number of factors into it, but um, definitely um, sort of controlling emotions based on expectations and then a couple of bumps in the road and not being able to, you know, to, to write them. And, and then just kind of a, a panic, a wave of panic that descended on, on the group, which was, which was really bizarre. But we could do, we could definitely do a three-hour show on that. But I must think, on, just to back, get back to happy memories, Go on. on the, in the England game, I'm, we, after the game, was one of the most fun nights we ever had. And you were incredibly generous in that you were a brilliant part of that night. We were sitting together on the table and it was just, it was just crack. Was that where we snuck out the back door through the kitchens? Yeah. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> Always got somewhere better to go, <laughs> didn't I? Yeah. yeah, it was, it was where great. Where did you end up? Or great. do I want not ask? Oh, no, it, was, it was Chris Ells back in it there. Was it? Was it? So. Okay, that's pretty grim, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Needed to be done. What a glorious career it was. Actually, the only other thing I was going to ask you about is the Lions in 05. Um, oh, that's just reminded me about Brazil off the back of it. Yes. The weirdest... So I was, I was always following Shane around, but in a... <laughs> Because do the lines first of all, because I think you were the only person who came back from 2005 saying that you'd had a good time. Yeah, because I was, the lines was always so important to me. Like not, not that I even dared to think I was going to be a lion, but my dad is from New Zealand. And so it's, um, he w would have gone to lions games when he was a, a kid in the 1950s. And he would be telling me about Tony, loved Tony O'Reilly. My dad absolutely loved Tony O'Reilly and telling me about um, Don the Boot Clark. And then, like everybody else, sort of grew up with that almost mysticism of, of the Lions in the 1970s in South Africa and, you know, tied in with, with I think, the video that everybody of our generation had in their house, 101 Best Tries. So, <laughs> like, literally, incredible. like, worn and through. Another yes, I, I, Best I, Tries as well. well. Yeah. Yeah, we one had was that. green and one was red. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> just never, never out of the, uh, the video recorder. Yeah. So, um, it was it was there and, and you know, and, uh, it was always there in the background. So, you know, to be picked for it, I I remember, you know, when we found out, I was with, you know, Dennis and Brian, myself, and we went back to Dennis's house and uh, we had a good, we had a good few jars on us, <laughs> but we, we kind of had a moment together where we said, listen, we've, we're, we've done this now and you don't know what the lines, whether you're going to start, whether you're going to, you know, you're going to be a dirt tracker or, or what it is, but we did feel that there was something in the lines that meant that you owed it to the lions to bring whatever you could to the party to be positive about it. And that's, we kind of made a, um, made a vow that we do that. So, uh, you know, even though things were, you know, you know, stressful on that lions tour, we hadn't remember we hadn't won a world cup. You know, these guys yeah. had won a world cup. They sort of tasted that they had a certain way of doing things. You know, we were a bit younger as well. Um, so I didn't want to put, I didn't want like that, experience to be poisoned by you know the bad run results of course it had a massive sort of impact on it and you know some people had a terrible time but I did want to try and make the most of it and I wanted it to be a good memory because listen I didn't know whether I was going to go on another Lions tour yeah. I didn't go on another Lions tour that's my one so I wanted to have a you know a positive experience yeah it, it, it was a pretty I mean I'm glad you say that but I think for a lot of people it was a pretty miserable 10, 11 weeks, then never stopped raining. Yeah, and like you're in, you're in New Zealand at, at not a great time. Like the squads, the squad was too big. The players weren't playing enough. There was, you know, the, it, it, like behind the Alistair scenes. Campbell. Yeah, like that probably, that really wasn't a smart move. And, and in fact, I was done for good reasons, but not a smart move. Yeah. And so that became a sideshow. And um, yeah, I think splitting up the two teams, the fact that, you know, there was, there was literally two teams, although I was sort of across the two of them, you know, yeah. there, there was two teams. Which and never, then, which, I mean, I've never been on Lions, but it would never work. So the Lions is about everyone has to believe they have a shot. Mm. Yeah. And when you do two teams, you just take the, you take the, the dream out of some people's and, and And also it's separate rooms, that kind of stuff. Stuff that, again, all done for good intentions. And, and some of it was based on stuff that worked really well for you guys in the, uh, in the World Cup, but just didn't work. And I think there's definitely been some, you know, core lessons that will never be moved now, learned off the back of that tour. They've got to listen to certain stuff to, to, to get to the point where we were speaking about earlier on about emotion, that emotion and well-being 
is such a huge part of, of delivering for the line. It's much more important than lots of other stuff. Mm. So get that right. You're kind of halfway there. That's why Gatlin was good up until this year because he's not an overly technical coach. It's get the get the emotion right and listen, you know, trust in some really good players. That was so. The, the story, very briefly, off the back of that, was that we'd had ten weeks out there. I don't think we'd actually done. I hadn't done very much with you. I no. was very much a junior reporter out, sort of vox popping in the streets. But it had been a long ten weeks. I was totally out of my depth. It was a pretty toxic talk to be on, particularly as a oh, I was a twenty-four year old reporter. I remember getting done by oh, the wizened old hacks. I'd been asked by Alistair Campbell in one of the press conferences to ask like a sort of PR question, and I'd asked. Geech a question and everyone had sort of put their pens down and turned around. And gone. <laughs> it took me about 15 years to recover yeah, from that yeah, in the yeah. eyes of the old yeah. journalists. But off the back of that tour, I went from Auckland to Rio. I'd met a mate in Rio to go and do a bang average, but went and did about four or five weeks surfing. From Rio, we then went down to Florianopolis, which is about a six, seven hour bus ride. We then got a two and a half hour boat out to this island in the middle of nowhere called Illa Grande which is an old leper colony. And you arrive, it's got one beach and one end there's a, there's a motel, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of hostel and the other end there's a hostel. And we got dumped on the beach and we thought, well, we'll go to the left-hand hostel. So we walked along the beach, went in, said, have you got any, any beds left? He said, yeah, I've got two beds left in his um, Portuguese. Took us up to one of the rooms, bunk beds. And there on the floor, in the middle of this island, off two hours off the coast of Brazil, were two lion's bags with the initials SH. <laughs> Quite extraordinary that. And you'd left, uh, talking about someone who's always got something else to go on to, you'd left a couple of hours earlier. Yeah, yeah. We'd, and you'd given your, ba- your bags, I'd, we had a I'd, good couple of days. With I'd, gone, I'd gone um, back to London and then flown out. My friends were doing a, you know. A, they were having a, they yeah. were having a very good time. They were having a good time. Yeah. They had done about um, six months traveling around South America and, um, I jumped in for for a couple of weeks on my holiday with them, and um, yeah, it was. I'm, I'm. I suppose it was probably pre eBay because <laughs> you didn't think I'd like been flogging all my <laughs> my lines kit. It was lucky that I checked out that they actually knew me. Um, but yeah, I had a brilliant time there. Actually, uh, bizarrely, that was where I met my my future wife. Is that right? Yeah, for the first time. Yeah, met Emma there. I did not yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah. So something did come out of good something, came out something of that. Something good came out of. <laughs> What a small world, what a career. You had some very, very good days. And with that in mind, what, what do you make of Ireland today? Um, I, I'm really excited about Ireland are at the moment, for the first time in a long time. And I would have been um, one of, of Andy Farrell's, I think, you know, harshest critics over the last couple of years. Um, I, I felt to me a little bit like a Joe, Joe Schmidt light situation. Um, I didn't see what he was trying to do that was different. And and to be honest with you, um, both himself and Andy Catt, I thought if they Mike. didn't... Oh, sorry, Mike. Mike, Mike, Mike Catt. <laughs> if they didn't deliver a um, a performance against England and probably a win against England, I think you know, Catty was really in, in, in trouble because the, the attack up to that point had been pretty abysmal. And if you remember, in the first... You know, ten minutes of that game, it did look as if you know England were dominant, and and Henshaw just almost single handedly dragged Ireland back into that game. Then everything changed, and um, the performance was was really good. You know, the rooking was much faster. Um, you know, there's the clean out was much better, and allowed Ireland to to sort of do what they wanted to do. But even at that, I would have had sort of reservations about what Ireland were looking like for this autumn series. And then Japan, there was a really distinct change in the way they were playing you know definitely the way they were exiting was was different their setup of rolling plays they've they have some brilliant ball players now it actually makes a big difference they have the best ball playing i i, I listened to um some uh like a, a podcast uh from from new zealand and uh interesting they said they thought the irish front row against new zealand was the first time they had better ball players maybe ever Really? Yeah, and that is a that's a big thing for what Ireland are trying to do. So, all of a sudden, they had a you know a better philosophy. I could a philosophy I could see and understand, and then with some really good ball players implementing it, and then but you're still thinking it's Japan. So you know, are we going to be able to do that against New Zealand? They did. They did. They played brilliantly against New Zealand. Really good rugby. Um, um, Argentina not quite as good. There's a few changes, but still you could see what they're trying to do. So. The Autumn International Series is different and the Six Nations has a different pressure. Yeah. That means there can be a sort of reversion to 
you know, um, traditional play. And that's now the big test because if they can get over that and they can apply the type of rugby that they were in this series to the Six Nations, it doesn't mean that they win the Six Nations, but they will be in really good shape and in good shape going forward as well towards the World Cup. Yeah. You've fallen in love with Ireland again. Yeah. Is that too much well, or not? Is no, that fair? Yeah. No, I... I've always said that I just like to see teams attempting to play the game how we want it to be played. And I, you know, obviously I went through a hate period of Ireland when they were number one in the world and I just thought it was such a negative way of playing. And they... Is that harsh or is that, was there a period where you can reflect, you, you could agree with that? Oh, um, I think when they were, when they were a top team in the world, they, I think they were playing decent, you know? I think it wasn't, it wasn't beautiful, but... Um, so it's I, very I, South African. Effective. Um, it was one, yeah. out, one out passes. The one out, the one, the one out, the one out, the one out stuff, I, I hate, I absolutely hate, I can't hate anything more. Um, and I didn't like, I thought they over, over box kicked. But um, I certainly, after that period, yeah. when it started, actually the way they were playing became less effective, which was really the last year of Joe Schmidt's you know, reign. And then into the first you know, period of, of Andy Farrell's, it was, I hated it. I hated it as well. They would do this thing, you know, which was, they'd play a number of phases, they'd get into midfield and you'd have options both sides and they'd have a box kick. It's like, yeah. what's going on? Is that where we're at? You know, is this is this where we are as a as a sort of you know, our, uh, um, is this where the intellectual property is in, in in Ireland at the moment? So to move away from that, I I wasn't sure if they were capable of moving away from it under their, with their current management, but they are. Yeah, I mean, I I ex we were just talking about before. I expected the change to be quicker with Fa with Andy Farrell and with Mike Cat. Um, but it's taken a bit of time, and it looks like now they've made a they've made a con well conscious development. Or you know, there were simple, easy wins there in terms of with the ball handling forwards that you had to just you know put in tips, put in slight movements. You've got the footwork of Furlong, you know, Porter Kelleher. They're all, they're all they all can play. Let alone with it, if you then bring Ryan and Henderson in there, and then you know you step up someone like Doris. You've suddenly got players, and you need to use, utilize them in the proper way, and they're starting to do that. And then yeah. I've always said that if I always, like Ireland have had good backs for the last couple of years, mm -hmm. but no one ever gets to see them. You yeah. know, you have and that was a real frustration for me as well, that especially in the opposition twenty two, and it was a negative for Ireland because Ireland were kind of in this spot where they can out muscle a lot of teams, but not every team and not the best teams. So you would see they get into the twenty two and they do this. He can go round the corner, round the corner, round the corner. Round. It's get, so frustrating. And then get a penalty and then crossfield kick it or chip it. Or or get turned over. Like, yeah. you know, against the best teams, again, then lose entire momentum. And you would have full back line out, you know, waiting out. And, and, and it wasn't even as if they were animating, screaming for the ball. It was like, well, this is what we do when we get into 22. I was like, this is not. In this. So there was a big movement away from that. And when you're playing against less good opposition, you can say, and I suppose, you know, we it, it's it's sort of a trope in in um, in rugby. You go well if something works for you, keep doing it. Yeah. But you have to look a little bit bigger picture than that because what works maybe against Japan or maybe against Scotland or uh, and maybe against um, no Italy. I'm not comparing those three teams, <laughs> but I'm just saying that potentially does. It's not going to work. Um, against South Africa it's not going to work against New Zealand may not work against England may, you know may not work against uh, Scotland on a given day so actually what's the easier way to score tries here and what's a little bit more sophisticated thinking on what you're doing Just to broaden this out though I mean obviously Ireland going great guns England with a good November France looking very very juicy as well Scotland can fire their shots now what do you put the the, the sort of the has there been a, a movement in the balance between north, northern and southern hemisphere, or are we just looking at I think, too much of a short? I think of time? we have to be a little bit careful about overstating that because Ireland have made significant changes to what they're doing. And that, you know, I think very impressive and very neat, but not the finished article. And now that people have seen that they're doing something different, they're going to be analysed with that new type yeah. of, of rugby play. So that's going to be a challenge for them, starting with the Six Nations, but also going through to the whole World Cup cycle. Um, England, I think, were... I, it's, it's unfair to say they were lucky to beat South Africa, but... You know, but um, I thought they, you know, and I, I thought they showed real mo a metal in, in getting the win, but South Africa should have won that game. And so it, they didn't lose it in a way that you think South Africa will go, right, we've got to rethink here what we're doing. Mm. They won't be rethinking anything. They'll go, 
we know what we're doing. Yeah. We're going to do more of it, yeah. and we won't get. We won't give up that. You know that light try. We won't give away a yellow card at that time, and we'll win that game. And we'll win it in a world faff, Peter Steph to toy. Yeah, I mean, with with that, I mean, but England dominated them in the first half. They just then got overpowered with what came on afterwards, and that's what England have to look at. But I agree with Shane. They were lucky to sort of win that game, but it was. Um, I also agree with the young kids stepped up in a scenario where they could have crumbled and they took that great opportunity for that try um, and then and then fair play for Marcus and, Smith. But they will hopefully get better also. And I, I think that's the other thing. Like that England team, nobody thinks, well, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I certainly don't think that's the maximum England can play at. No. They're far from it. You know, I think they can, they can hit a really, really high level. And um, I'm kind of glad that, um, that uh, Eddie has, has sort of, talked about playing slightly differently as well because he's the you know he can be the man to deliver a, a, a you know a game plan that I think it would be really effective but maximize the players he have and be good rugby as well I think they strayed away from that I think he got tied up in this you have to kick the ball you have to kick to win and I think the stats got skewed from New Zealand because they're a big kicking team and New Zealand are um, were very successful so they skewed the stats on uh, uh, along with South Africa but you can't do what New Zealand and South Africa do. You have to do something different. Good England teams have done that. Good Ireland teams have done that. Good Welsh teams have done that. Um, and good Fran- French teams have done that. And that's the other thing. They're back on the stage like they haven't been for 10 years. Yeah. They're so good to watch. So good to watch. And they're themselves. Yeah. They're not anything else. But I think I think that what, what's changed a little bit in the Northern Hemisphere is what I think is, you look how young the players are now. And we go back to what you said about Leinster. I feel that there's no fear in these. So, and if they're good enough, you have to play them because they don't have, they don't cast, they don't sort of carry historical mistakes or uh, I did this in a pressure situation, so I can't do it again. I think they've played a different rugby all the way up where we were sort of brought up on not making mistakes and understanding it defensively. Whereas now it's like, we'll just go score more than you. And I think you sort of, I think what the Northern Hemisphere has sort of done is sort of bought into that with your likes of Finn Russell, with your likes of Marcus Smith, obviously, Freddie Stewart at the back, Stewart at the back, Keenan, people like who just want to play. Yeah. And I, I think it's just like watching Brazil. <laughs> but, but that's a really good point because I think Ireland had been so risk averse for so long. Yeah. Like there had been options there. And, that, and I played under Joe Smith. So he, he wasn't a negative coach. He would, you know, he would set the, um, the position and set the players, set the attack in a certain way and there would be options, always options and always wide options and we would actually get, you know, you'd get criticised if you weren't taking them. Now what happened though, somehow, again, rugby being psychological, somehow, um, because of, I think, probably a latent pressure that came from Joe and the management, players stopped taking, looking at those options out wide and it meant that it was a very blinkered approach to rugby. And yes, it meant that it was a lot of possession, there was very little turnover, and there was few enough errors, but it also meant there was no tries, or there was no exciting, there was no line breaks. Yeah, but, but that's what is always interesting about stats, is stats are stats, but you have to be able to under, understand them. So Ireland would always have huge amounts of possession, huge amounts of passes, and everyone's like, yeah, but we passed the ball more than any team in the world. And yes, but look at what the passes were at the time. Yeah. It's not about that. How many, how many tips? How many offloads? Zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's all st- people who keep quoting stats. You have to put them all into context of what, context of what the game is. And now, balance is how I for, for me now rugby is about speed of breakdown and then a balance to your attack. There are times to kick. There are times to pass. There are times to offload. But. I really want to do a round table. On because I think now you're looking at the top eight in the world game. You could probably put you could put four quarterfinals together in Rugby World Cup 2023, and you'd really struggle to to get four out of fours in terms of winners. It's it's condensed hugely. It used to be New Zealand, South Africa, Australia miles ahead, and England and and France could take a chunk on their day or two. Wales and Scotland would be very lucky. N- now you can probably see. Results, yeah, you know, just just coming out of a hat. There's a lo- lot of good games. A lot well. of good uh, there's, games. A, there's potential for a lot Japan, of good games. Argentina, you know, Argentina knocked over the All Blacks last year, etc. Mm. But but let's come back to it because I, I, I think there's a, there's a bigger chat around where the game is right now at the international level. What I do want to get into with you, as obviously with all your European glory, 
in your back pocket is the fact that the Heineken Champions Cup is back this weekend. It's had a bit of a tweak to the format, and I'm going to try and run through this as easily I was as possible. To figure out what the format. I, I, was. So was I. <laughs> I've actually I've actually gone back and had another go at this. I didn't actually realise this until we we were sort of starting to look at it this week. So. 24 teams back into the competition. Previously, there were 20 before the outbreak of COVID. Slightly amended the format again this year, EPCR. So there are two pools of 12 teams, and that is based on league positions and how you did in the competition last year. Each club plays four pool games, home and away, against two other teams. And you will not play against a side from your domestic league. So hopefully that bit is clear. What then happens is once you've played those four pool games, the top 16, so the top eight in each league, will then progress to the knockout stages of the tournament in the round of 16. And in the round of 16, the number one ranked team in pool A will play the number eight ranked team in pool B, and then you'll match off against each other accordingly. Interestingly as well, the three clubs ranked 9 to 11 in those pools will then qualify for the round 16 of the EPCR Challenge Cup. I hope you're still concentrating with us at the back. Uh, Those 16 teams play that two-legged knockout match, as we've said, on a home and away basis. So that's the round of 16. And then the quarterfinals, semifinals and final remain one-legged affairs. The final is in Marseille on the 28th of May, 2022, at one of my favourite all-time stadiums, Stade Velodrome. Did you play there? No. Unbelievable. Did you you, you do the England... France, England in 03 warm up. Yeah, the only game we lost. The only game we lost. Yeah. It's a hell of a stadium, though, isn't it? First, t- first time I'd shaved my head, and someone thought I was uh, Dorian West. Yeah, it was <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was that big after the pre-season. It's about 106 kilos, and everyone thought I was Dorian West. Yeah, that, brilliant. That as long as they don't think it's no. for me. Well, yeah. no, I mean, I mean, you, you know when you get you, you want people to call you, you know, something where you're dashing up. I've been mistaken for Wayne Rooney, Dorian West. Imagine, so, um, imagine if Zara had made that. I mean, that would be very dif- different, wouldn't it? But Dorian West at, the, at, at, win- at Windsor <laughs> Castle. <laughs> All right, <weekend>. Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Commander Chief. Uh, okay, so hopefully that explains... Uh, I'm not sure it does. Uh, no, <laughs> have I done that really badly? No, no, no. So, two, I mean, two pools of 12. Yeah, you've explained you will it well, but I think, I think for the, anyone who's trying to dabble into rugby and yeah. this is the, the global it's, thing to go, what, this is the big big competition to go watch they'd be like what so that is that is the first question therefore is the, I, I can't I mean this is a, a really personally I'm, I'm very personally invested in this competition because I've had so many amazing years broadcasting it I just cannot find the spark and the energy and the colour that, that was in this competition 10-15 years ago or is that just me because I'm old and cynical well I, I think also that the level has dropped off. I am quite interested in this year because I think there are unbelievable teams out there. Agreed. Toulouse are playing fantastic. Bordeaux, who we haven't really spoke about for a long time, obviously. Sims. La Rochelle. Yeah, La Rochelle, who can play unbelievable rugby yeah. as well. Then you add in the fact that like Leinster, uh, Le- Leinster and what they can do. Uh, Leicester are back for for the first time How in a few years. How good was Welford Road yesterday? Yeah, I mean, Welford Road was pumping and you, know, you saw out. how much it meant mm. to them. Um, so obviously Exeter have, have sort of eat their way back towards the top at the moment with with wins. Not quite there, but then you've got Montpellier, you've got Quinns. Can Quinns stack up that rugby on a European stage that they played last year? Um, and can they, you know, they, they were a little bit unlucky on the weekend. Uh, they butchered that try, didn't they? Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, there's, I think I think there are, there are great teams in there to create a great competition. Is this format... You know, the last day of your group stages where you're looking at who might sneak into the last couple of qualifying spots, that sort of story. That's got great stories in the history, but are we going to get that now? Uh, we, we did that, get that. Just thinking of those final days, those round six matches used to be epic and they were proper Fermat's last theorem crossed with Pythagoras. <laughs> Do you remember the one we did where Exeter and Claremont, I think we were in studio together, and Claremont needed a losing bonus point to go through and they tapped and went? Was that with you? Do you remember that? And I, Exeter I do, ended yeah, up I don't getting. Know, I, I don't know where I was. I do remember the it, instance, uh, though. The, yeah, it just it was just chaos, yeah. but brilliant. And trying to get you know messages on from yeah, the stand yeah, yeah. and also, you know, what's going on elsewhere. But you, I, I agree, Tim. So, uh, there has been something sort of lost in this tournament after the restructure. And yeah. actually, something was lost. Well, it also split broadcasters. Yeah. Doesn't help. And, and that, yeah, and that wasn't, you it wasn't helpful. And but I do think there is an opportunity there because Agreed. things have changed. Well. In order for Europe to work, the Premiership teams have to be invested and have to be good. And they, I think they are. They are more so than they have been. And the same with, with France. Now, you would get 
there's a certain cohort in France that will always be invested in it. Um, like and to lose, it's their competition. So they're always after it. Um, and they need to be playing. The French teams need to be playing well. And the French French rugby at top fourteen level has changed a lot in the last couple of years. There's been an influx of um, foreign coaches. But even the domestic coaches are looking at things slightly differently. Sean Edwards has had an impact much greater than just the national team, the way they defend, you know, the urgency that they put into it and the commitment levels that they're at. So we're seeing some like such exciting rugby out of France. Not all, you know, not all the same, but some exciting rugby. And I think the thing about the premiership and and what's generally why the premiership is a good uh, product is that it's not homogenized. There's a lot of different styles. In that, you know, Leicester play in a different way than than Bristol. You know, Harlequins play their own way. You know, Saris do their own thing. There's there's much you know there's much greater um, you know um, types of play, and yeah. that makes for interesting fixtures. It yeah. makes for interesting games. It makes for you know it's like boxing. You know, styles make fights. You know, yeah. it's the same yeah. at rugby. And there's players. I mean, there are <coughs> genuine, exciting players to watch. You know, Radwans, Mays. Um, you know, your Simmonses, your, your Marcus Smiths, your Don Brandts. You, you've got a whole lot of individual names that I think are, are more, you know, that's without even going into France, where you've got Kobe, you've got Entermac, you've got... Um, Jalibert. Jalibert. You, you, I mean, there are there are Dupont. How can we ever forget Dupont? Yeah. Um, I think they're... <laughs> should we just keep should naming? Should you go? Just, just say just names. Great, Doris. Great uh, pod. <laughs> Keenan. Um, I just think there are so many individuals now that can also hold this competition together. There can be great stories through every, and and that's sort of what I'm excited about now. How they present this format, I think, is going to be key, and how they make it. You need to make sure you know those final those final games. Who's in what position? What? Yeah. And you need to sell that because yes. I agree with you. The round six of chip in a chair we have a chance yeah. they need to lose to them yeah. they need to win that uh, we need to match, score a bonus yeah. spot you, you have to have that and there's, there's a couple of it's funny there's a couple of individuals that are changing things as well I know that's sort of you know, maybe overstating it a little bit but Marcus Smith is changing things in the way he plays and, and I know Harless wins it's a philosophy as well and there's more than him but I don't think they play the way they play without that particular individual yeah. and I think that you know the way they've played shows other teams you know everyone tries to recreate them but there is a different way of playing and the more ways of playing the more interesting it is and and the the person in i think in france that's doing similar and we saw it during this, this the autumn was in tobacco in terms of the risk level of what you're willing to do and and how you're trying to play so there are kind of two individuals that i thought actually these guys are you know more than just um the teams they're changing the way people will play the game both in their own teams and outside of it it's yeah. like a warm blanket when you see a French number 10 run from behind his own goal line and just, and then, and just and leave then the just ball leave for someone to take pass on the outside oh. and you're like it's, it's back you're suddenly back in the early yeah. uh, in the late 90s Blanco and yeah. that, it was it felt like it felt uh, like there's a couple of passes that are that you remember yeah. okay and the one for me is um, Campisi in the World Cup 91, steps in and I as a kid uh, tried to do that a million times that's yeah. all we did you know we were messing around my brother we'd be stepping in just leaving off the shoulder it's just <laughs> what you, even when we were playing you know professional rugby we'd be trying stuff like that because yeah. it was so beautiful and that pass by him in that game just remind, in, in, instinctively reminded me I was, I was lying down on the couch I, I had COVID at the time <laughs> watching it and I, it got me to my feet I mean I was like this is something special there's yeah. something else going on here just for that moment only they'd finished it yeah. they could have and yeah. should have yeah um, you got me really energised for Europe this year. Yes, the other, yes. Yeah, but the other thing I was going to say, funny enough, is is obviously round six was always amazing. But the other thing that was brilliant about Europe were those back to back December fixtures because you'd have a proper crack at each other, and then you'd go again on your yeah. own patch a week later. And I do think the round sixteen knockout games, home and away, could be something very, very special. I think there's a lot to like about that. And, and it, that was a, a re, um, as a player, really stressful as well because really? oh, yeah, because. You thought we we would generally have that game, or we did till the, towards the end of my career would be take place in the Aviva, and would this be momentous? Christmas. Every you know, and there was a a crowd comes up for that 
from everywhere, you know, from everywhere in Leinster. It's, 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 it's bigger than just the sort of, you know, RDS is like 14, 15,000, whatever it is. This is 45, 50,000 people. That's a, that's a lot of people that aren't coming to games, you know, every weekend. Yeah. It's part of the Christmas spirit, as it were. <laughs> and then that, you know, that almost the players take that on board. So you could have, and we did have like big wins, but then you have to go over to somewhere, you know, somewhere a week later with almost with the pressure of, of having, Performed really well, and going well, like you know, if we, we can't lose this game now, having done that, you know, th- th- so um, it was kind of a stressy, it was a stressy environment that second game. If you'd had a big game uh, the week before, yeah. Generic question: Tell me if I'm wrong. Are we looking at a winner from France, England, or Ireland? Can you see a um, Ospreys or a, <coughs> no? I no, think realistically, no. you're looking at the three. Okay, I don't think it's even. I don't actually think it's even close there. Okay. Is Europe a fair fight these days? Uh, um, in, when you look it, at the budgets of Toulouse and La Rochelle and Claremont against a sale, I don't know why I'm picking sale out necessarily, but you know, Glasgow. But it, but it's Bath. never it's never really fair, right? R- rugby <laughs> across the board, you know. But has is, professionalism isn't widened that gap? Now, because, well, the, yeah, money is one thing, but look at catchment area, the number of players that play, you know, your your coaching, your coaching philosophy, your history, all these different things, you know, add to it. And um, what league you play in, you know, the the um the you know the difficulties that come with playing top 14 rugby, that come with playing uh, premiership rugby, um, and how playing, you know, right United Rugby Championship is a different thing. And it is, and how players can be rested for that. And so there's a greater focus on on Europe potentially for some of those teams. So you know, it it can be unfair, but there's it's not as just linear as going. These have this budget, and these have this budget, and these have this budget. It's not just as linear as that. It's a factor, but then there's some there's other factors that in, in play as well. And ultimately, France biggest landmass, loads of space between clubs, loads of different brands that then can fall in to support their clubs, and they've got the largest playing pool, and they've got the largest audience. <laughs> so you would expect them to generally be at the front runners now yes they spend a lot more money yeah but i think that's just down to that rugby bed that they have that they have down there now it it then so people then have to adapt what ireland did when ireland went provincial and then you know they fell in love with the the heineken champions cup and it was all geared around then they could rest their players and that's where they hung their hat on because that is ultimately how they prepare for international matches um, you know, but then for why it doesn't quite work for the Italians, for the Welsh, is the same reason that, that they've gone down to provincial like two teams, but they still don't have the player pools to fill those two teams. Mm-hmm. And it's the same in Wales. That, you know, the you've sort of lost a little bit of the bridge end, the swan, the the old school Swansea, the Caffili, and are they still? Are you, are you still producing that many players that then filter up? I don't know whether it's worked really how they anticipated it working, but um, there's always a chip in a chair. But yeah, unfortunately, I think I think it's suited. The Premiership is just strong. Um, it's it's hard, but it, it it's strong and it's got a good player pool. So it's always going to favour those those three. I think we we talk a lot about the fact that when Leicester are strong, England tend to be strong. It does feel like we've sort of gone back in time with Leicester atop the Premiership. To lose as European champions, etc. It feels like the old guard are back bearing their teeth again. I, I think the Premiership needs Leicester strong, strong. Yeah, it does. It really does. And I was thinking about the sort of different um, periods in the in the European Cup where you know Munster were super strong and they had to lose, and that time that that Leicester team were so formidable as well. That was really important to yeah. the growth of the competition and what they're doing. So for them to fall away was tricky, and so it's they're needed in both competition. Competitions, not that they need to be, you know, winning it or every year, but it's almost what it means for the rest of the sides in in the Premiership when they're, you know, you have to go with them. Front, yeah. you do. I you can't lie, I did love them being bottom for a couple <laughs> of years. I did, I did sort of love it, and they're so lucky not to get relegated. But it is good to good see to them back. back and and actually playing, you know, better like brand of rugby than what they and it's possible. seemed to know what they are now. I think that's the best thing that what Borthers has done. Is bringing an identity back to them because yeah. um, I talked about it before when I, w- I went to watch Le- Leicester versus Gloucester and it was like two teams who got completely confused where they are. Le- Leicester had this unbelievable backline but couldn't win any ball. Yeah, and sort of, and, and Gloucester didn't really know what they were trying to do. 
uh, they were stuck between a way forward base team and back end, and, and now it seems to be that they they've seemed to again out what they and they they're different teams playing different styles as well. I, I don't want to see every team playing the, the same style. And as much as I dislike the way South Africa play, for example, I, I, I think it's horrible to watch. I kind of like having them there yeah. and having them as a baddie. We were down, saying this, this this November. It's sort of, the, you've got to begrudgingly respect what they do because oh. they're bloody good at it. Yeah, no, I totally respect uh, respect what they're doing. But <laughs> also like the fact that, and they seem to have lent into this yeah. as, you know, where nobody likes us. So, you know, yeah. we're the bad guys. And, 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 and no led, led, Yeah, led, and led by their their... Is he a director of rugby? Whatever well, he's a water boy. Is he? <laughs> you <laughs> tell by me. their water boy. Um, I think it's nice to have that. It's you've got now a story around international rugby as well. It's yeah. not we're all nice. It's like oh, these are the, these are the bad guys. These are the good guys. Yeah, yeah you know, that's nice. Did you see Razzie's social media with his dog? He's doing a lot of. Oh no! But I've seen he's doing I, a I lot of a drink. Hot, I saw him in a hot tub. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah. He he's, had, he's, he's got like a British bulldog, right? And it was attacking him in bed. He's like, "You're England, you cheat." <laughs> it's on, uh, it's on socials. So today. it's quite good. The dog was attacking him. He's doing a lot of drinking on on Twitter as well. There was a, there was a drink to toast England. There was one. I think he poured a couple of um, shots. One for Dave Rennie after he blasted the ref yeah. in the Australia Wales game. It'd be boring without people like that, wouldn't it? Um, let's finish then. Just a couple of to watches. Team players, what do you, you you've you've energized us all right, I'm and glad, our audience? I'm glad. You for see, all it's back. Come. It's back. I knew. I knew I could get it's it out good. of you. Yeah, there you go. It it's always um, there. It's just, I, I, I mentioned a couple of them. I've mentioned a couple of. Them. I think Marcus Smith is a special player who's transformative. Actually, yeah. I uh, you know everything about the way he plays the game. I like, but the impact he has on players around him, both you know for Harlequins and for England, just eating, eating that guy up. Can't yeah. get enough. Yeah. He's what you know. You know, sometimes games go by and a game will be on TV and you may or may not want to watch. It's like Ronnie O'Sullivan in snooker. If yeah. Ronnie O'Sullivan is playing snooker on any time, I will always watch it. Yeah. But as soon as he's out, the TV goes off. Yeah. If Marcus uh, Smith is playing, I'll, I will watch that game yeah. no matter what. Um, into Mac because of the way you know he he changes the game, the um, changes the the risk profile of what teams are doing and how he sort of inspires other teams as well. And then kind of a, a kind of an unknown or less well known, and it's from an Irish perspective, a guy called uh, Dan Shanahan. Okay, who's a hooker for Leinster. Uh, he's not particularly well known. He got capped um, for Ireland in the autumn and performed very well. And Cal Ronan Kelleher is such a good player as well. But you might want to check out the try that he scored at the weekend. You know, you say that this hooker looks like a center or a wing. Yeah. His finish was remarkable. Really? <laughs> We're remarkable. But that, that is just um, sort of, that is just an example of the type of all-round performance and player he is. So he's going to be challenging hard for Kelleher with Kelleher for the um, Leinster hooker spot. He may not get it, but if he does come on, which he will, he's going he's gonna to cut up. What about you, Tins? Um, yeah, I think in terms of teams... I think you, you're struggling to look past Toulouse, even though Bordeaux is sitting top at the moment. I think, let's see, Leinster. Um, is there any... I hope Quinns can sort of get that game going. I know they're, they're not quite fully firing. Uh, they've got to get through this period before the yep. right, before the weather turns good and they can really start turning it on again. You know, you look where they were in January last year and then and where they ended up. So I don't think they'll be frightened by that, though, will they? No, I, I don't think so. I think that's the strength of it. Um, in terms of players, I think that there's so many. There's so many. I, I agree, Marcus Smith. I, um, I think Jaminet at fullback. He's been a breath of fresh air as well. Freddie Stewart, um, just going out there, and we've got to give some shout outs to four, some forwards. You know, that that French, but the French <laughs> back have to? row. Oh, yeah, Aldrit. I think. You know, I'm going to keep banging on about Simmons because I just think he is a he's a genuine forward who changes. It kind of you know changes the way people play and changes the way people have to think about him. You know he's got the speed of a he can beat people like a back. He can outgas people, but he also scores from two yards out all the time yeah. because of his power and stuff. So I think there are genuine players who can hold this uh, this competition, you know, sort of accountable in themselves. So yeah. that's what we want to see. We want to see those best teams. And when it comes down to those top sixteen teams, there could be some cracking matchups. The winner will be. Oh. I somehow haven't thought about this. Marseille, 28th of May, 2022. Who, which two run out? Do you think, will it be all French again? Or can you I see? I think uh, it's, to, to lose are phenomenally strong. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenally strong. And they have the best player in the world. Um, they have a couple of the top players in the world, but they have definitively the best player in the world, yeah. Dupont, who's sensation. Clermont, Leinster, mm. Montpellier. We haven't really mentioned Clermont. No, Racing. 
You would say that Leinster are going to go well with how Ireland are playing. They, they will probably Quinn's get Leicester. Yeah, right. uh, listen, Leinster will will do well. It's it's whether they are sometimes they're compromised by the league they play in. I think they you know listen they've lost they lost against Ulster a couple of weeks ago, but they win a lot of games too easy. Yeah, and um, the problem is it was the point that I mentioned at the very start when you're doing something, you know, in rugby or to keep on doing what you're doing, but longer term against the very, very super elite of Europe, that's where Leinster have gotten stuck the last few years because they haven't, you know, either been used to it or they haven't been able to um, have the game plan that is different enough from what they were doing successfully week in, week out to literally win a semi-final or a final of Europe because they will get to that point, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's just whether they can deliver for those, you know, one or two massive games. To lose for you, though, you're sticking with to lose. I, I'm struggling to look past to lose. Going to take someone very special. Yeah. Particularly with the final in France, you have energised, reinvigorated, <laughs> and excited for all that is to come. And every rugby fan wants a rich and an exciting European competition let's hope we get that this year in the Heineken Champions Cup BT Sport broadcasting each of the 48 Heineken Champions Cup pool matches and I just, uh, just realised that we bagged this, the, the structure but I think that's the structure that I came up in my global season oh right do you want to go back and re-record well no I'm just maybe I, mean, I we think need the round start, 16 we need to start trademarking stuff that we start on the show I think <laughs> I think that well, we, we had Ellis Genge as uh, Leicester captain tick Right. England captain, Tick. He now wants to play on the wing. I'm not sure we can help him with that. But, um, B Sport, the place to watch the games, and Channel 4 are showing key fixtures from each round as well. Are you doing any on the, on Virgin, the Virgin after Christmas? Virgin Media in Ireland after Christmas? Yes. Good stuff. Get stuck in on that. Um, here is to a really good competition. Some rich, exciting games and some superstars taking big steps forward. That is it as far as we're concerned uh, for the body of the show. Let's just quickly take you through our Spiz section, all the pressing GBR business that you need to know. It's December. So first up, we've got the perfect Christmas gift idea for you. Come along to our tour next spring. We are heading across the UK and Ireland to Sheffield, Liverpool, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Newcastle, Manchester, Dublin, Nottingham, Plymouth, Swansea, Oxford, London, Birmingham, Bath and South End. Do you want to come to the Dublin game? Yeah, yeah, well, well, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, we'll pencil over that. You're very welcome. Uh, tickets on sale now, perfect in a, in a Christmas stocking this year, and all the info is on our website, apparently. Uh, we also, last week, uh, just about recovered from our trip to Dungannon Rugby Club, where Hask was running gym sessions. I was very proud to referee the mini section. Uh, Jill was with us. She was coaching the women's side, and Tins couldn't resist having a run out for the men's first 15. I think we're still waiting to hear if you've been cited for that, aren't we? <laughs> hopefully. Six, hopefully six the, year uh, ban coming uh, in for your. The Vodafone camera that they gave them did not yeah, pick the it up. The VO has not picked up your disgusting act at uh, the breakdown. Uh, the podcast, <laughs> actually, we recorded that evening, is really special for a number of reasons, not least Hask's quite frankly, unbelievable Lions stories and Jill's take on women's rugby in Ireland as well. Work to do there. And that one's going to be out for you on Monday. Make sure you have a listen. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday with the normal shambles that is the good, the bad and the rugby. Thanks Anytime. a million. It's, it's fantastic. Been really good fun. I really and enjoyed it. Come back and have another, another crack soon. I sure will. We love it when people come and can talk about rugby. Which yes. Isn't, which is a rarity. It's refreshing for us both. It's it? lovely, isn't it? We will see you next week. Thank you, everybody, for watching and for listening. Leave us a review. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, whatever it is that you do in those uh, circumstances. The show is pulled together by producers Shara Kilgannon and Connor Hewitt this week and our world-class fixer. Thanks to Matt Chuck Norris. The Good, the Bad and the Rugby is a folding pocket production. Look after yourselves. See you next week. Oh.